Welcome to Parallax Views, a new IEA series of discussions on cultural affairs. My name is Mark Glendenning, and today I will be talking to Sarah Fillimore, a barrister who specializes in family law, about uh, an issue that I think everybody who is interested in civil liberties should be really concerned about. And that is the concept and the police procedure of non-crime hate incidents, uh, which are being used by some police forces uh, to intimidate people who enter into debates, discussions online. Uh, Sarah has established a campaign called Fair Cop, which is seeking to bring public attention to this uh, authoritarian aspect of the criminal justice system. Now, the terms Kafkaesque and Orwellian have become cliches, but I think there is no other way in which to adequately describe uh, what is now uh, taking place and the way in which the police are abusing uh, the powers that they have. And these powers, as we will discover from Sarah, are uh, rather obscure. And I think also threaten the whole concept of the rule of law. Um, so before we come on to your particular experience of non-crime hate incidents, Sarah, could you give us something of a background into how this uh, aspect of policing has come about and, and how it is deployed? Yes, I've been on a very steep learning curve um, since about the middle of 2019. Early, uh, around February 2019, Harry Miller was the subject of police investigation for allegedly hateful tweets. So he and Rob started, Rob Jessel started the organization Fair Cop and invited me to join in June 2019. And I thus began to find out more and more about what was going on. I then took a very um, even keener interest in what was going on when I myself was recorded for a non-crime hate incident back at the very end of 2019. And I would never have discovered this had there not been public declaration by, I think, the person who reported me on Twitter that I've been recorded for life of my hate. Um, so what I understand has been going on, I think it probably started around 2014, 2015. There appears to be a European-wide um, movement to really push for rooting out hate in all its forms in society. Because there's five steps. I don't know what the middle steps are, but the first step is nasty tweeting. The final step is murder and genocide. So Harry Miller and I have been told that our nasty tweeting has got us on the first step of the road to murdering people. Now we both take exception to that. Harry Miller's tweets have already been found um, to be protected political speech. My tweets perhaps weren't so lofty. There was one example of me saying, my dog would call me a Nazi for cheese. That's now on a police database with a very cute picture of my dog. Because what happened is the person who was reporting me used um, key search terms for my tweets. Um, he put in trans, I'm sorry, I'm assuming he, I don't wish to misgender, trans, police, Jew, with the terms used, they managed to find three tweets which they called um, racial hatred, and one of them I was objecting to Holocaust denial. So I'm as confused as I expect anybody else would be about what on earth is going on here, but the police do seem to be gripped by a very widespread movement that this is something essential to protect society. The problem is, however, as I'm sure you're well aware, that hate is given a very broad definition to include dislike and ill will. The recording of these incidents is entirely at the subjective perception of the person who complains, and they are not allowed to be questioned by the police, and they are recorded as the victim, and I am recorded as the suspect. And on my case recording from Wiltshire, for the first lot of reports made against me, it says this, 
a barrister posting hate. So obviously I am challenging that on very many levels, not just Article 10, but also my rights to privacy, data protection law. I'm saying this is false information that's been provided maliciously and the police are refusing to delete it because apparently I haven't provided unequivocal proof that it's malicious, which of course is a standard that no one's going to meet. I mean, I have provided evidence of the person tweeting in a gloating fashion, haha, you're recorded for life for your hate. And what else can I do? So I hope that's a helpful precy of why we are where we are. The police seem utterly wedded to this, as we've seen in Scotland, politicians too. I think it's delusional. I don't think this is going to do anything to help hate, combat hate. I've asked Wiltshire to tell me um, what operational decisions they're making about me. I've been reported and recorded by Wiltshire twice now, so I'm clearly escalating. I'm not changing the way in which I'm discussing these matters on social media. So when are they going to arrest me, is my question. And they will not answer that. And the most chilling thing I think your listeners need to be really clear about is when Harry Miller's appeal came before the Court of Appeal in March of this year, the barrister for the College of Policing said, in terms, there are now so many of these hate incident non-crimes reported, the police can do nothing with them. There are over 120,000 of these incidents and they sit there on a police database. They are not investigated. They do nothing but possibly impede your um, chances of getting a job in the future if they're revealed by way of an enhanced DBS check. So if Harry Miller loses his challenge in the Court of Appeal, because that's based exclusively on the breach of his Article 10 rights. So if he loses, I and a teenage girl have applications in the wings waiting to go. And we are basing our applications more on Article 8 and data protection. We're saying it is simply wrong to record false information about private citizens on a police database that they will not be told about. So we're given no opportunity to challenge it. I think on any analysis, most would agree, this is simply wrong. It isn't policing. It is the creation of another Stasi. And anyone with even a modicum of historical interest knows where that road goes. So that, sorry, that's my attempt to praise you. I hope that's understandable. Yeah, but um, very much so. But it, there's also so much to unpack for those of us who, well, as far as we know, um, <laughs> haven't yet had ourselves uh, recorded as being, you know, uh, suspects of hate or whatever would be the kind of terminology the, the cops would now use. Um, so it seems to me there's a, a whole dimension of this, um, an important aspect of this, as with all of the contemporary type of authoritarian politics we now see, as opposed to the sort of authoritarianism that was associated with religious conservatives like Mary Whitehouse, you know, back in the 70s, or people who were overt overtly advocates of a sort of totalitarian one-party state in the in the sort of the uh, the middle part of the last century. Um, the thing that makes this so difficult to conceptualize, understand, and therefore oppose is that it's very sort of postmodern. It's, it's not really articulated in a very honest and direct way. I generally like to see my authoritarians coming. I like to see the, the glint coming off their jackboots and you know, I'd like to see them waving flags and all this kind of stuff. You, you know kind of what you're dealing with. This is a, a much more post-rational, post-enlightenment form of madness, it seems to me, because I mean, the, the, the point you made, which I think was very interesting, was that you or I or anybody potentially could end up having this record, well, indeed you do, um, simply because another human being decides to report you and in their subjective judgment, you have expressed hate, however you define that, uh, rather amorphous concept by opposing the view that they hold on something. I don't know, a Brentford football supporter might claim as a Queen's Park Rangers fan that I've expressed hate towards um, their club. I mean, now, where does this lunacy end? And, and, and what is its kind of philosophical starting point? Sorry, I'm rambling, but 
you've, no, quite, I, I think, you've, you've triggered me. Well, I, th I think it's really essential to have these conversations because I don't think this is a new beast at all. This is an ancient beast. People want power. And the way that they get power is by controlling language. Because if you're not allowed to say things, it has an impediment on your ability to think about them. So if you can't think or speak, you can't challenge. And that's what I think we're, we're seeing here. I think there's a small group of people who quite deliberately have set out to gain power. To do that, they must crush their, energy, their enemies. What's perhaps different about it now, however, is they've managed to bring along so many nice, well-meaning, kind people in their wake who think what they're doing is a good thing. Because, of course, none of us want to be prejudiced or unkind. We all remember the horrible treatment of gay people, you know, not that long ago, actually, within living memory. And I think people are rightly ashamed and people are hoping that there's going to be a better future. But what's happened is that this desire to protect people's rights to love and have sex with whoever they want, as long as they're consenting, has become corrupted. And I think has become part of a movement for power and control. And that is going to be secured by silencing those who seek to disagree. And I think that's exactly what's happening. Bizarrely, it's become very linked to these issues of um, gender identity. And I think and I hope that's going to be their downfall, because what they've done is awoken an army of really angry women like me, who thought of ourselves as you know nice woolly liberals, a bit left leaning. But we're being told that we may not talk about things. And not only that, if we try and talk about them, we'll be reported to the police and we'll lose our jobs. So that, I hope, will be their undoing because they have sparked um, a level of resistance from people who are organised and very angry. Um, what do you say about um, this kind of will to power being behind uh, this ideology, and we don't just see it in relation to transgenderism, but now across a whole variety of narratives and, and areas of, of, of human interaction. Um, has it, it seems to me at its core, the idea that language itself is a form of, of coercive power, potentially, mm -hmm. so that even expressing a view um, in relation to transgenderism or something else is not just expressing uh, in a peaceful way a, a difference of opinion, which is what should be the case in a pluralist and liberal society, but is actually in itself a form of violence. Now, when you go down that road, speech then becomes mutually exclusive, doesn't it? And so ultimately democracy becomes impossible because if oh, what you say to me oppresses me even though you're not physically attacking me or suggesting i should be physically attacked by somebody else if you just expressing a view that on some issue no doubt we disagree on a whole variety of things probably um then it then if my right not to be offended upset by what you have to say on something trumps your right to say it, then there's there's no democracy. You don't have democracy. Of, of course, every, everything will then have to be calibrated to the level of the most vulnerable, the most self-identifying as oppressed. Uh, and the consequences of that are, are quite obvious and we're seeing them all around us. Um, you mentioned, well, actually, before we come on to the Harry Miller case, which you, you mentioned in, in relation to your own experience, experience. Um, could you tell us something about how the police themselves justify this? Because you, you mentioned this extraordinary idea that there is an escalation uh, that they see uh, between tweeting and, 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 yeah. and murdering. I mean, first of all, and I think you did mention it, but my synapses didn't capture it. Where is this actually articulated? Where is it set down? And how is it that, and what is it the police in Britain say about, I think, you know, information gathering. That's one yeah. of their justifications, isn't it? Yeah, there, there've been various iterations of the hate crimes guidance. I'll just refer to it all as a hate crimes guidance because it has at its root, the subjective perception of hate, um, the inability of the police to challenge the reporting person and the recording in secret. So that, that's very much the, the bedrock. 
basically, uh, it, it, Stephen Lawrence's murder has cast a very long shadow on the police, and quite rightly, they stuffed that investigation up from beginning almost to end because they were racist. There is no doubt about that. So you will find in the guidance and in discussions that everything is predicated on Stephen Lawrence's murder. And if only the police had had greater powers to record people who said racist things in their homes, then Stephen Lawrence wouldn't have been murdered. Now, that, of course, is a nonsense. Where this went wrong was not because the police didn't have powers to, to properly find out what his killers were saying, but because they refused to investigate at the outset. So... But there's clearly an enormous amount of guilt um, felt by those higher up in the police. And this has become attached to these discussions, as I've said, on a wider European basis, that the way that we root out hatred and racism and homophobia is by policing much more carefully what people say, because that is the first step on the road to murder. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't look up the first steps. I don't know what two, three and four are, but first step are naughty tweets and fifth step is murder slash genocide and, and this, and this is, is sorry i'm just going to say that's why it's so dangerous because the, the police are fueled by a sense of moral righteousness that what they are doing is to preserve the very fabric of our society so they don't see anything wrong in recording women like me men like harry miller in secret because we are on the first step of that road to killing someone. Now, the Court of Appeal made this very point to the College of Policing in Harry's case. They said, but, but do you see no difference between somebody making racist speech and a female academic discussing the impact on women if men can self-identify as women? And the College of Policing just said, well, no, hate is hate. But the evidence, say, of Professor Stock in Harry Miller's case was you can't rescue racist speech. It's pretty obvious. But discussion about something as fundamental as the immutability of biological sex and protecting single sex spaces for women is nothing like a racist tirade. So what we have, I think, is all these forms of speech lumped together, because, as you said, if someone says, I feel offended, that is enough to make the speech hateful for the speaker to be punished. And that is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, could you just briefly tell us about the the, the Harry Miller case? Because not everybody may know yeah, who Harry is. There was quite a big um, storm about the first judgment back in November. He had two cases running at the same time. The first against his local police force for coming round to check his thinking after he tweeted. The second was against the College of Policing, so an argument against the very legitimacy and lawfulness of their guidance. And it was a very interesting judgment from his um, honour, Mr Justice Knowles. He agreed that Humberside Police had breached Mr Miller's Article 10 rights um, because they went round to his place of work. They, they, it was a, a chilling effect on his ability to speak freely. His speech was also found to be protected political speech, although it was a bit unsophisticated. It was part of a legitimate political debate because obviously the government at that time was consulting on reform to the Gender Recognition Act. So far, so good. Harry then appealed um, on the refusal to strike down the guidance because he, I, and, and many others don't see how that judgment can be coherent if the guidance leads the police into such a serious breach of a fundamental human right, then there's something wrong with the guidance. However, the College of Police are arguing that whatever the police do after they've read their guidance is purely an operational decision and it's all down to the police and that they're trying to dodge the bullet that way. We don't know what the Court of Appeal is going to say. The hearing was in March. We're waiting desperately for the judgment. But all I can say is from the kind of questioning from um, the judges, it did seem to me that they shared our unease at how this has all mushroomed. And, and particularly, as I, uh, the College of Police made clear, that they're, they're now trying to push this into classrooms and teach children about the awfulness of hate and how to report it. So, um, again, the historical <laughs> echoes are coming yeah, through loud and yeah. clear. And, Goodness knows where that's going to end and up. And happily, um, I, I, it was difficult because I was watching on some shady link, but I, I thought I saw the judges sort of sit up aghast at this suggestion that children were now going to be very much part of this 
model to stamp out hate. We all know where that will lead and the consequences it has for a society. So fingers crossed, the judgment actually oh. does say that this guidance is unlawful. I, I think it demonstrably is. If Harry loses though, however, I'm waiting. Miss B, a teenager is waiting and we have applications ready to go for judicial review on the data protection issue. So moving on to how um, those of us who are uh, hugely supportive of the courageous stand you're, you are making uh, at some risk, uh, one assumes to, to yourselves, um, how, how can we help? Well, regrettably, with cold, hard cash, because the policy is one of lawfare. We can see no other way to challenge this than in the courts. The high levels of the judiciary do not appear to be captured. I think we saw that with Maya Forstarter's case in the employment tribunal. Her belief in biological sex was dismissed as not worthy of respect in a democratic society. That's only just been overturned by the Employment Appeal Tribunal on June the 10th. And women like me can hold their heads up high and know that believing in sex is not something to be ashamed of and it will actually be a protected belief. So I think a lot of us are feeling a lot more secure so the higher levels of the judiciary, I do not think are captured. So this is the only route we could think to go, but it's incredibly expensive. I mean, I've raised about 35,000 pounds now. If I proceed to a full judicial review, I'll need to get at least six figures. I mean, it is outrageous that it costs so much to get justice. It is outrageous that it's been left to private citizens. I would really like to see the, e um, the EHRC stepping up and doing some more. And I think the well, signs think are that they will. That. <laughs> well, exactly. the, the signs are much better since there was a change in personnel. It used to be oh, headed right. by David Isaacs, who'd actually been the chair of Stonewall for the previous 12 years. So that gives wow. you an idea yeah. of where the EHRC was going. We've now had a change of personnel and some very encouraging signs, intervention in Maya Forstarter's case. Oh, good. Um, okay, I didn't know it, that. You know, it's it's. I think that's quite interesting. Better late than never. It would have been nice yeah. to have seen this. You know, before all this horrible mess got cemented and solidified. But hopefully, we're going to see some more intervention from them. I mean, they are the the body that was set up to protect and promote um, the human rights protected under the Equality Act. So I think they need to start doing what it says on the tin. Uh, it we we've got to get back to some normality. It cannot be left to individual citizens to risk possibly losing their house. I mean, I may get a costs mm. capping order. I may only have to pay £25,000 if I lose. That may not bankrupt me, but it would possibly will. And certainly it's not a financial risk the vast majority of people would be willing to take on. But we couldn't think of any other way to try and regain mm -hmm. the rule of law and <clears throat> rationality than by going to the courts. So if people feel as uneasy as I do, then please, 10 or 20 pounds donated to the crowd funders would be very well received. And uh, people can access the crowd fund what through the, the Fair Cop website? What, what yeah, is the website? If you, um, yes, if you go and have a look on Fair Cop um, website, just www.faircop.org.uk or just Google Sarah Fillimore Crowdfunder, Harry Miller Crowdfunder. There's quite a lot of coverage and you should easily find it. So that I think is the best way at the moment people can help us because we do seem to have had some success with lawfare. The ONS, for example, had to back down and concede that they were acting unlawfully when they sought to provide for self-identification of sex in the census. I mean, this is how bad things have got. The census was going to allow people to refer to the sex um, on their driving license, which they could change by writing a letter. Now, how, this doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help people with diverse gender identities. It is not providing information about reality, which we need to function as a society. So that to me was really chilling and thank goodness for the organization Fair Play for Women because they managed to raise £100,000 in three days and get um, to court pretty quickly and the ONS backed mm. down. So lawfare, it's, it's expensive, but it does seem to work. Um, one of the, the contradictions um, I, I see with some of the, obviously there are individuals and in, within the transgender um, community and they probably have very different political views as do people in all other 
types of category. But one of the things I do find surprising and contradictory is the way in which uh, a very militant minority within that faction, on the one hand, say that gender is all fluid and that individuals should be able to assign themselves as whatever they they want to be in terms of sex, um, but that at one and the same time, they want as a matter of right to prevent people like you from expressing your views. So on the one hand, the whole transgender cause is couched in very sort of liberal or libertarian sounding rhetoric. But on the other hand, there's this really heavy duty authoritarian and unpleasant streak whereby people are, are threatened with violence who just have different views on the subject. I think that's explained by looking at the, the makeup of the transgender community, which unhelpfully is a huge umbrella. Um, Stonewall, for example, say there must be about half a million transgender people, but they define this as, say, men who cross dress on the weekends. I think most people who support transgender rights have in their head the, the traditional idea of the transsexual person who has gender dysphoria, who is deeply distressed by their physical body and ought to be helped and supported to do whatever they can to live at ease with themselves and the world. Nobody, I think, has a problem with transsexual people and they are small in number because gender dysphoria is a rare condition. There's then another group or very confused and often traumatized teenagers, the vast majority of which are girls. And that's a whole different can of worms as to why they're so anxious to escape their female bodies. But I think the third group is the problem because the third group are misogynistic men. And that's what's turned this into such a toxic brew because they are not used to having their entitlements challenged. They're certainly not happy with uppity women doing the challenging. And that explains this, the sheer degree of viciousness that is coming from a small proportion of people who claim shelter under the transgender umbrella. I don't know what I'd call them. Um, they clearly take pride in being non-conforming, but that seems to take a physical um, manifestation in threatening really serious violence. I don't know if you're aware of what happened at Brunel University recently. No. After the, the Reindorf report, which is an excellent read about how Essex University were led into breach of its statutory obligations to protect freedom of speech because it was, it was infected by Stonewall's persistent misrepresentation of the law. And if, if a woman dares challenge transgenderism, she's a transphobe, etc. And I think in reaction to that, a student at Brunel University um, posted on Twitter, I think at least three separate pictures of guns that this person owned and said he wanted to go target hunting for turfs. The immediate response of Brunel University was to tweet underneath it, trans rights are human rights. There was obviously a wee bit of an outcry about that. And fortunately, Brunel woke up, the person on that Twitter account resigned and Brunel contacted the police as they should have done because there's the perfect example of the limits to freedom of speech. You don't have the freedom to post pictures of what looked like an automatic weapon and proclaim that you were looking for women for target practice. I think that's a criminal offense. I'll be interested to know what the police think about it, particularly as there is a woman facing criminal charges in Scotland for posting a picture of a ribbon. But I won't say any more about that because um, these on our live criminal proceedings. But I'm not the only one to notice the hypocrisy and the disparity of treatment. And I do think that it's this minority of very privileged and entitled men who don't like being told no, who are the root of the problem here. And I mean, the, the level, the degree of threats and violence is shocking, and it isn't both sides. I had a very unedifying scrap with a fellow barrister on Twitter a few days ago who proclaimed that people like Maya Forstarter, Professor Kathleen Stock were transphobic bigots or conspiracy theories, and that by saying this, he was putting his life in danger. I think he had 357 replies, some of them quite rude because it was a ridiculous thing to say, but I couldn't see a single threat against his life. I couldn't see a single demand that he suck anybody's lady dick. But this is a daily event for women online who dare to say no. 
So that, that I think is why this has got so toxic so quickly, because these men have been empowered by the well-meaning, by the nice and the kind people who think it's all just about equal rights and inclusion. Well, it isn't, not anymore. There's something much darker and more dangerous going on now. And thank goodness people seem to be finally waking up. Uh, two concluding questions. Um, in a, a, a very interesting article you had in The Critic, you referred to the German concept of Zersetzung and how it was used in the old East Germany against non-conforming, politically non-conforming people then. How do you relate it to what is happening within the culture now in Britain in, in oh, well, relation it's, it's, to freedom of speech? It's being embraced enthusiastically because it's such um, an effective, useful concept. You don't have to bother building extra prisons, having more police officers to round us up, feeding us while we're incarcerated, because what you do is you create the prison in the person's own mind. You make it very clear to them that there are things they may not say, nor even think. They don't know if members of their family are informing on them, if their children or their neighbours are, so they shut up. They keep quiet. It's a very, very effective strategy, and that's why it was used by the Stasi. That's why it's being used now, and no doubt will be used again in the future, because it's a very good way, an effective and cheap way of keeping and maintaining your power by getting effectively people to volunteer to do your policing and be your prison guards for you and making the home a prison that we're too frightened to step out of. It, it takes a few individuals who just frankly have had enough. And I, I appreciate my position of privilege. I'm a self-employed sole trader. I've had many complaints made to my regulator, which thankfully so far have not been upheld, but I don't have a boss. I don't have a line manager. I'm not at the moment at risk of losing my job and my house. I wouldn't be here talking to you now if I were. I'm not that brave. I'm not brave enough for me and my daughter to be living on the streets in pursuit of my principal. So it's a hugely effective strategy, and that's why it's being used. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that now you see a move towards criminalising conversations within the home. So in Scotland, mm. the new Hate Crime Act um, potentially means that, I don't know, J.K. Rowling sitting around having a dinner party in her flat in Edinburgh, if somebody were to report her for saying something on, on transgenderism or an it's issue. It's the first could step to murder, you see, so we'd well, all be encouraged quite, to do it. We got to Rowling nip this in the bud. Presumably you know? is a, a little nervous up there in yeah. uh, Scotland now, but I see that the, the Law Commission for England and Wales were wanting this applied in their recommendation mm -hmm. to the government um, mm -hmm. across the whole country. I think they then later withdrew it because of uh, a backlash, but it, you can see the way this mm -hmm. is kind of of going and so i think that you know you evoking uh this this very interesting concept is 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 very apt and and fascinating and that's why it captured uh, my attention the last question i want to ask you which i'm going to be asking everybody i'm interviewing in this series of talks is as follows um do you think that in 10 years time uh the situation for, for political liberals, uh, small L liberals, will have got better or worse? Do you think there is a logic, a dynamic contained within this new authoritarianism that is simply going to steamroller us, you know, bulldoze us out of the way and that in 10 years' time, all kinds of things are going to be impossible to say, maybe even a conversation like this or do you see the beginnings now of a, a progressive fight back for enlightenment liberal values oh definitely there, there's clearly a fight back and we are winning the legal battles and hopefully the court of appeal judgment will be another decisive victory um it's it's so difficult i mean it's so interesting i think I was naive and i grew up and i learned about the horrors of the second world war and the human rights act and, and how British lawyers were at the forefront of, of 
proclaiming our universal fundamental rights. And I thought as a species, we'd carry on progressing, but we don't, do we? We, are, we seem to be quite a rubbish species and we, we go back and we need to correct. And I do, I think the fight back has begun. What worries me, however, is how far the pendulum will swing because I know there's a lot of criticism about women like me being funded by shadowy far-right groups, which of course is absolute nonsense. I wish it were true. If any shadowy far-right group wants to fund <laughs> yeah, me, absolutely. Get I'll take your cash. Yeah. But you see, because the, the difficulty is we do share <clears throat> some aims with say traditional Christian fundamentalists, but we don't share many. And my worry is, is that all those people who said no debate and tried to silence us will now be ushering in something much worse than us. And the pendulum is going to swing back to repression, um, to homophobia, will be in a place where nobody wants to be. But this is what happens when you refuse to discuss like rational adults. It, it seems that as a species, we're not good at holding the middle ground and the pendulum seems to swing with ferocity to one extreme to the other. Definitely the pendulum is moving away from repression and Stasi-like tactics. But, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. I mean, the police are so utterly captured. I, I still am quite worried about that. But certainly the signs from politicians are encouraging. I, uh, it's not a happy thought. I don't know where we're going to end up. It, it doesn't seem that we're very good as a species of learning from our past mistakes and that we now want to recreate a secret police force. What next? Walls? Walls to keep people in? It, the, the history we, we stumble over these lessons with even the most casual glance at history but we never ever seem to learn so your guess is as good as mine but i'm hopefully the signs are good that there is a return to rationality and respect for the rule of law which obviously is the only thing that makes a society worth living in without the rule of law we have nothing but chaos so fingers crossed that that doesn't Absolutely. happen well thank you sarah for a really fascinating talk, not just about the specific uh, question of non-crime hate incidents, but the, the philosophy, the politics uh, surrounding this very specific aspect of, of the new authoritarianism. And I'm, I'm hugely grateful to you for kick-starting uh, this series of discussions. Oh, well, and, and I to you, thank you very much for inviting me. I think this time, certainly two years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I think it, it's really important and necessary that these conversations are had. So thank you very much. Thank you and good luck with your campaign. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.